at South Hills. Today, I want to take a moment and share with you something that we consider very important here at South Hills. So important that we actually recommend for every member of South Hills to be a part of a South Hills group. There's a scripture that I want to share with you. It's found in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. And it reads like this. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. It's talking about the importance of gathering together with other people in a small group so that you can learn and grow and dive deeper into God's word and ask questions and learn from other people's stories. In a group of people, you get to see a bigger lens and a wider lens of who God is. Let me share a couple stories with you. One woman shared that as a working mom, it's been hard for her to find time to prioritize relationships with other women. Getting into a South Hills small group helped her not only just to find some time for herself, but to build deep, meaningful connections with others. Now she considers her South Hills group like a second family. And at another one of our campuses, a retired business owner started a group for entrepreneurs and business owners. Before the group started, none of the people had connected with each other or many other people at the church. Church. But now they've built a helpful network and a solid relationship with other like-minded Christians who are looking to lead and to grow in a deeper, closer relationship with God. We actually have a value at South Hills that says we grow more in circles than we do in rows. If Sunday morning is your only step of growing in a relationship with God, that's a row. Getting into a South Hills group, into a circle with other people is where you're going to find the deepest level of connection and the deepest way of growing in your relationship with God to draw close to God. At any one of our campuses, there's a couple of ways you can sign up for a South Hill small group. You can take the connection card that's on your chair and sign your name on that and say you're interested in the South Hill small group or our church center app. And that's another way where you can find what groups are near you or what groups have opportunities for you to join so you can grow deeper in a relationship and a connection with God and others. So we have, uh, we've been in a series, we're finishing up a, a series today uh, on, on the things that we say and what we say and how we say it and why it all matters uh, called wordplay. And so uh, we started this series at the beginning of the month talking about the conversation that we're having with ourselves and the words that we say to ourselves. Uh, in the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about the words we say to and about one another. Um, and then today we're finishing up uh, a conversation, we're finishing up the series talking about talking to God. Now, I, I don't know what it is experience, your experience has been, whether you've grown up in church or you are been a person of faith for a long time or you're just here kind of exploring and asking questions. The truth is it doesn't matter where you're at in that journey. We all have had experiences praying and trying to talk to God. And I, I don't know if you've ever felt like praying was like, really difficult or really challenging, or you just didn't know what to say or how to say it, um, but that, that's really a universal experience. And I, I, I ran across this clip uh, from a show called Blackish that's on TV. It's pretty good. Um, uh, that kind of encapsulates um, how challenging it can be to pray sometimes. So take, take a look at the screen. Dear God, it's Dre, <laughs> but you already know that. Please give me guidance about Zoe. How do I help her see that you were there for her the same way you've been there for me? I mean, you're usually there for me. There was that pizza thing. That was rough. Pizza with no meat? What is that? Come on. Okay. Okay, where was I? Oh, Zoe. I'm so scared. She's so young and... Is this blanket pilling? Did somebody machine wash this? Black nanny? What, what is her name? I gotta talk to her. Uh, focus, Dre, focus. You're talking to the big guy, the notorious G.O.D. Wow, I miss Biggie. Gone too soon. Okay, 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 for real this time. Dear God, Father above, giver of strength. Is somebody making popcorn? Please let it be kettle corn. 
Please let it be kettle corn. Oh, why do I suck at praying? Anybody ever felt that way? I mean, that's exactly how it goes, right? Man, I have felt that so many times. Well, there, there's so much uh, information and teaching out there about prayer and so much that could be said, but I actually wanted to kind of back up this morning and, and come at this conversation perhaps from a slightly different perspective. I, I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you're kind of watching a conflict or an argument unfold, and at some point, one of the people said to the other person that was involved, you know, do you know who I am? Do you even know who you're talking to? Right? That, that, that question is almost, it, it, when it's used, it's almost always coming from frustration that's kind of born out of some sense of entitlement or self-importance. When, when I was a kid, I grew up at, at a really large church in Sacramento. And um, uh, when I was in high school, I was volunteering. They had this big harvest festival and, and you know, just tons, hundreds, thousands of people would come to this harvest festival. It was a huge church. And, and so I volunteered to serve and I was like doing traffic flow. And so they gave me this vest and these little, you know, light cone things. And I was just, I, my, my sole job was you cannot let people stop right here. They have to keep moving. And so that's all I kept doing. Everybody would stop. I'd go up there. Hey, you got to keep going, you know, please, you know. And so most people, and then a guy pulled up in a BMW. And so I went over there and told him to go. And he just kind of looked at me and waved me off. And then I told him to go and then he wouldn't go. And so I left him alone for a minute. And then I came back and told him to go. And he stepped out of his car. He put his car in park and he stepped out of his car and he walked over to me and he said, do you even know who I am? And I had no idea who he was. Um, see, when somebody asks that question, it's a way of them saying, you should be more mindful, more respectful of me, and just let me do whatever I want or give me whatever I want because I'm really important. And, and sometimes it can actually be kind of funny to watch those moments unfold because it typically happens in the middle of somebody having a meltdown when somebody's sort of losing their stuff in the middle of everybody else. And, and while the attitude and the heart of the person saying it is almost always wrong, it's still a really interesting kind of question because the implication is, if you really knew me, if you knew who it was that you were talking to, you'd talk to and treat me differently. Now, the truth is, who you're talking to affects what you say and how you say it, right? Like, have you ever walked away from a conversation only later to realize that who you were talking to and then it made you sort of rethink everything that you said or did? Um, I, I actually have had that experience a lot and, and uh, sometimes I'm even on the other side of it. Like anytime I get to travel and speak someplace, or, you know, I go to a friend's church and get to speak there um, where people don't know me, it's always really, really funny to see the difference between how they interact with me and how they talk to me when I'm just some random guy that wandered in and is as a guest or when they find out that I'm the guy that's the pastor that's actually speaking. Now, I, I try really hard to, to not give off the pastor vibe, whatever that is, because it always changes how people talk and behave around me. People always start to like, you know, tense up and they change the way that they talk and they, you know, look at me super weird and treat me differently because our perceptions of people shape our interactions with people, right? I mean, you don't talk to, if you're married, guys, you don't talk to your wife and your coworkers the same way, right? Criticism from some troll on social media lands completely differently than criticism from a, a really trusted friend, somebody that you're close to. The reality is we all respond differently to different people, depending our, on our perceptions of them and de depending on our perceptions of the moment and the conversation. And, and our perceptions are based on a combination of different things, whether it's their position or their reputation or their track record or their experience, but also our interactions with them, our experiences with them, our relationship with them. And, and so you approach every conversation with an idea of who it is that you're talking to and that idea that you have in your head, it informs how the conversation goes. And sometimes it's conscious and sometimes it's not. Sometimes you're aware of what you're thinking about this person and what you're gonna say and what they might feel. Sometimes that idea that you have or that impression that you have or that perception that you have is accurate and sometimes 
It's not like, have you ever been on your way to have a conversation with somebody and you found your, you know, you find yourself sort of playing out ahead of time, all the different scenarios and different ways that the conversation might go, right? Like, like when I tell mom that we're not coming for Christmas, she is going to freak out, right? And then she's going to say this, and then I'm going to have to say that because then there's going to be words. Or, or like if I just if I just go over to my boss and ask him for a raise, he's probably gonna he's probably gonna bring up that thing that mistake that I made last month and just tell me that I'm just lucky to still have a job. Or, or when I tell my wife how much I spent on this TV or these tickets or that boat or that truck or whatever it is, right? God help us all when she finds out. And, and we haven't even had the conversation yet in those moments, right? But we're already dreading it because we're anticipating what they're going to say and then what we're going to say in response and how it's all going to go. And all those assumptions become the context for that conversation. And they change what we say. They change what we hear. They change how we respond. And in most cases, they change the entire outcome of that specific interaction. <laughs> Have you ever been preemptively defensive Because you were certain that when you told that person what you needed to tell them, that they were just going to lose it. They were just going to explode all over you. And so you just started the conversation with an attitude, right? You just started the conversation defensive. Well, why do we do that? Well, because our perceptions of people shape our interactions with people. Now, the reason why any of this matters for us this morning is because it's not just true about our conversations with other people, it's most definitely true in our conversation with God. See, one of the things that's obvious when you look at the scriptures is that God created you and I so that a conversation with him with Him would be the most natural experience of our life. And it's evident in the scriptures from beginning to end, from Genesis to the Old Testament prophets, to Jesus, to the apostle Paul and the early church, over and over and over again, God makes it clear that he's not only listening to us, that he not only hears us, but he's also speaking to you and to me, that he's in a constant ongoing conversation with you. See, the conversation that you will have with God is the most important conversation that you will ever have in your life. And it will determine how you live and who you become and what you believe about yourself and about other people and what you believe is even possible for your life. But what we think about God changes how we talk to God and ultimately what we hear from God. So let let me show you what I mean. So the Old Testament is full of specific and sometimes very strict instructions from God to the Jewish people. Now, you don't have to be particularly religious to be aware of the Ten Commandments. They're the Big Ten. And while they were the Big Ten, they're actually, there were actually over 600 laws and commands given by God in the Old Testament. And the people weren't really any different from us. Human nature doesn't change all that much. And they, just like us, didn't really like being told what to do, especially without any explanation or any understanding of why they were being told what to do. And, And that's one of the problems with God, right? Is that God just doesn't ever really feel the need to explain himself. God, God doesn't, always explain why he's telling us to do what he's telling us to do. And so there's a particular moment early on in the Old Testament where this is exactly the case. So God has given all of these instructions, but instead of explaining why he does something better, he actually begins to describe himself and his heart. See, because in our conversations with God, we often want God to show us why, but he's way more interested in showing us who and talking to us about who he is and who we are. And so what is it that God said about himself in this conversation with these people? Well, check it out. It's in Exodus chapter 34, verses 36 and 37. It says, the Lord passed in front of Moses, began calling out, I am the Lord God. I am full of compassion and mercy. I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I lavish unfailing love to a thousand generations. I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin, but I do not excuse the guilty. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children and grandchildren. The entire family is affected, even the children in the third and fourth generations. Now, this is such an incredible moment in God's relationship with humanity. I I mean, 
that God could say anything here, right? And to describe himself, he could say anything in laying the foundation of what we understand to be true about him. He's God. And the people are like, hey, so tell us why we should listen to you again, God. And he could have been like, I don't know, maybe because I just like rescued you from slavery in Egypt for the last 500 years, or maybe because you saw me part this giant sea, or maybe because you saw me send fire down from heaven or food down from the sky or water coming out of a rock. I don't know any of those reasons. Or he could have just pulled the classic sort of dad or mom response that you know, you've probably pulled or your parents pulled with you. Because I said so, because I'm God, and you're not, so just do what I told you to do. But he doesn't do any of that. Instead, he begins to talk about compassion and mercy and love and faithfulness and forgiveness. And this moment was so pivotal, so formative, that all are part of these descriptions of what we just read. All are part of these ideas are echoed by different writers repeatedly all over the scriptures whether it's in Psalm 103.8 or Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 and 23, or Joel 2.13, or Psalm 86.15, or Nehemiah 9.17, or a passage we're going to read here in just a few minutes in in, in a book called Jonah. On top of all that, these words became, it became tradition for the Jewish people to recite these two verses before they would ever go into the temple. If they were on their way to the temple, if they were going into the tabernacle of the temple, before they would go in there, they would recite these words. Meaning anytime they were going to church to worship and talk to God and hear the scriptures, they would pause beforehand and remind themselves of who it is they were going to talk to, who it is they were about to experience and what he's like. And so God starts the conversation with them by saying, I am the Lord God. See, the first thing that you, that God wants you to know about him is that he's not limited in the ways that you are. He's transcendent. He's eternal. He's the one who is over and above everything. And not only is he in charge of everything, but nothing is impossible for him. And so then he goes on. That he's not just a God out there, but he's a God that's right here. That he cares about what's happening in our lives. So he says that he is full of compassion and mercy. That he wants to help us. That he, he steps into our lives. He steps into our mess to lessen the pain, to soften the blow. Even when the fault is ours. Even when we didn't listen to him in the first place. That he is full of compassion and mercy He says he's slow to anger and he's filled with unfailing love and faithfulness, that he's patient and loving and reliable, that he always chooses you, whether you choose him or not, that he's gonna stick by you and that he won't abandon you, that he lavishes. I love that he uses that word. What a great word. It means that it's without limit, that there's no limit to his unfailing love. And it says he lavishes on a thousand generations and he forgives all of our faults and failures and even the times where we arrogantly just sort of fly flat out do the wrong thing or the hurtful thing or the sinful thing or the even the evil thing. Now, and all of that sounds amazing, right? But then there's the second part that doesn't feel quite as warm and fuzzy because then he says, I don't excuse the guilty and I lay the sins of the parents on their children and grandchildren. He doesn't stop there. He says the entire family was affected, even children in the third and fourth generations. Now, if you're like me, This is where that whole idea of our perceptions of God starts to play into what what this conversation is like, right? Because if you're like me, you hear that and you go, yep, there it is. That's the God I was looking for. That's the God I knew was in there. That's the God I was expecting. The God that feels like he's kind of angry and pretty vengeful and will make you pay. He wants to stick it to you. But what I want you to see is this isn't God threatening us with like this idea of generational punishment. It's actually God explaining to us that everything we do has a ripple effect, that there's momentum to all of our choices, that no one ever entirely gets away with anything because our habits and our choices have consequences. And he's not talking about isolated incidents or a single choice. He's talking about repetitive actions. He's talking about habits. He's talking about long-term ways that we think and behave. Now, the truth is that science is just now starting to actually catch up with and confirm what God's been telling us for the last couple thousand years or more. 
Now, some of it's obvious because we all know sort of the whole nature and nurture conversation, right? We, we know that almost every human being, almost every human behavior is learned by observing and mimicking other people. For better or for worse, your kids learn to talk and act and interact with the world around them by watching you, just like you did from your parents and they did from their parents. But, but there's another level to this. There's another layer. There's the stuff that, that's even deeper than that, right? There's the DNA sort of genetic level stuff that we're predisposed to certain behaviors and certain conditions genetically, that there were traits that our parents and grandparents had and, and uh, along the way of their life, they got passed down to us. And because of that, they make us more susceptible from everything for, to, from cancer to high blood pressure to alcoholism to anxiety or even just having a temper. So that there are habits and attitudes that exist in my life that have their roots in habits and choices and attitudes of my great, great, great grandparents. Now, here's the really interesting part. That science is actually beginning, I just read this week, they're actually beginning to discover that there are patterns and behaviors that imprint and impact on, on, on you at a DNA level. Not just like something that you watched your parents do, but it's impacting your DNA for up to, wait for it, four generations. Which sounds, I don't know, a little bit familiar. See, so God is saying, look, when I tell you how to live or that something isn't a good idea, good idea for you, it's not because I'm trying to control you. It's because I love you. And not only do I, I, I but there's so much at stake. Not only do I want you not to wreck your life, it's gonna, those choices and those decisions are gonna affect more than just you. Maybe even extending generations into the future. Which is pretty heavy and sobering. Still, I can't help but feel, because I have that filter, that it just, that God's math feels a little bit unfair. That, that the way he approaches that part of the conversation, it just feels really harsh. And, and the truth is, is God's math is unfair. It's just not in the way that we think it is. Because the reality is that it's stacked in our favor. And so, there's this reality of what gets imprinted or passed on can be passed on for up to four generations. But did you notice how far into the future that God says his unfailing love extends? It's not for two or three or four or 10. He says, I lavish my unfailing love for a thousand generations, which means whatever it is that you've done, Whatever it is that runs in your family, whatever it is that you're most ashamed of, held back by, or can't get over, it's covered by God's unfailing love. See, this is how God introduces himself. This is what the people reminded themselves of every time they went to the temple, because this is who he is, and this is the starting point of our conversation with God. Which means that every time that you and I assume things about him that aren't consistent with this description, we're assuming motives and characteristics and, and part of the way that he is that he just doesn't possess. And it means that when you can't understand why, you can trust who he is. See, I, I wonder, what is it that you tell yourself about God? What are the, the perceptions and the ideas that hold on in your life? A number of years ago, I, I really like uh, Ricky Gervais. A number of years ago, I, he's, a, he's a very um, prominent atheist, though, and um, he, funny dude. Um, but I read, uh, I read an or editorial that he had written about his journey to being an atheist because he grew up in a Catholic family. He was a kid. And he begins to describe these experiences that he had with his mom and his older brother and ultimately led him to decide at the age of eight that there was no God, that it was all just a farce. It was all just make-believe. And, and I couldn't help this week but think like, he's got all these perceptions, all these ideas about what's true and what's not. 
I, I thought about people that I've pastored or people that I grew up going to church with that had all these perceptions and ideas that they believe in God, but that perception or the idea keeps them from actually beginning, be, being able to walk with him in a way that's just beautiful and life-giving. Imagine if every time you and I went to pray, imagine if every time you and I went to read the scriptures, we took a moment to simply remind ourselves to repeat this list, to read these verses. Imagine how that would shift the conversation that you have with God. Imagine how that would shift how you read the Bible or what you pray for, how you pray for it. I mean, don't you think it would completely redefine the whole experience if every time you sat down, you thought, this is the God I'm praying to, that he's full of compassion and mercy, that he lavishes unfailing love, that he forgives all of our faults and failures and brokenness. See, because our perceptions of God frame our interactions with God. Because ultimately, how I view what God says to me is determined by what I say to myself about him. When you begin to make this shift, though, it changes everything, you guys. Which is, honestly, absolutely amazing. But it also pre presents us with a huge problem. Because the truth is, if this is who God is for me and to me, then this is who God is to and for everybody. And we're not really prepared for or don't always enjoy that part. Because if I'm honest, there are certain people I'd rather God not be so, quite so gracious and merciful to. How about you? In fact, there's a conversation in the Old Testament between God and a guy that I mentioned a second ago named Jonah that was about this very thing. And you might know the story, no matter if you've read it or not, but if you only know the whale part, you're missing the best part. So there was a city called Nineveh, which had become overwhelmingly corrupt and evil, but God is compassionate and merciful. And because he's full of unfailing love, so God tells Jonah, hey, go to the city of Nineveh and warn them that they're on the wrong track. Warn them to repent and to change direction so that judgment and destruction will not come their way. But instead of going to the city of Nineveh, Jonah runs the other direction. Why? Because he's holding out. He's hoping for the judgment and destruction. He's like, come on, God, wipe them out. I've heard about Sodom and Gomorrah. Let's make Nineveh. Let's add them to the list. And eventually, after a little bit of redirection from God that happened to involve the big fish or the whale or whatever it was, Jonah does end up going to Nineveh and preaching to them. And it's the opposite of Sodom and Gomorrah. In a beautiful turn of events, they whole, the whole city from the king down to the lowest person, hundreds of thousands of people, they all turn toward God and he forgives them and he saves them. And how does Jonah respond to this incredible moment? One of the most beautiful, life-giving moments in all of scriptures where hundreds of thousands of people are reconnected with their creator. How does Jonah respond? to that? Well, this is his response in Jonah chapter four. Right after they all come back to God, it says this, this greatly upset Jonah and he became very angry. So he complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? This is why I ran away. I knew that you were merciful and a compassionate God, that you were slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. Looks like somebody's been reading their Exodus verses. He says, you are eager to turn your back from destroying people, but just kill me now, Lord. I'd rather be dead than alive if the judgment and destruction that I predicted won't happen. See, Jonah had grown up hearing these verses that we had just read hearing them describe God and his character and his posture toward humanity. He had no doubt memorized them and repeated them every time that he went to the temple, which is why he resisted and ran, and now why he's angry. And he's like, God, I knew you'd do this, that you'd dangle destruction in front of me but then you'd end up just ripping it back. It'd be bait and switch and you'd give them mercy and love and grace. And he's like, if you're not gonna wipe them out and kill them, then just wipe me out and kill me now because I'd rather die than see those people in heaven. Ever felt like that? If you haven't, you're lying. 
and you shouldn't do that in church. Now, we don't have time to unpack all the craziness here, but can you imagine having that kind of response to the overwhelming love of God and people responding to that mercy and that grace that they find in him? See, as it turns out, we're the ones who are demanding and petty. We're the ones with a temper and who just rage out on people. We're the ones who enjoy making other people pay. We're the ones who hate and hold grudges. We're the ones who never let people forget what they've done. And we just keep projecting all of that onto God. Which is why this conversation is so important. It's why we have to work so hard to tell ourselves and remind ourselves the truth about who God is because there's so much at stake, not just for us, but for the world around us. What we say to God starts with what we say about God, which is honestly, that's the way every relationship in your, your life works, right? Like guys, if you're married, imagine if you come home, for, if you were to come home every day and before you went in the house after work, you would pause for like 30 seconds outside the door and you would say to yourself, man, my wife is an incredible woman. And she's got a huge heart and she's resilient and strong and she's worked hard all day. And the one thing that I know is that she is the girl of my dreams still. And she chose me and it's my job to make her feel seen and loved. And this is the context for every conversation and interaction that we're going to have tonight. And then you took a deep breath and you open the door and walked inside. Can you imagine how that would change? Not only how that evening went, but the way that your entire relationship felt? It, it would. And, and to be honest, we, we know this because most of the time, we all collectively sort of do the opposite. We frame other people and our relationships and our circumstances in the most negative and dark way possible and we're suspicious of them and we're upset at them and then we wonder why our interactions go so poorly sometimes. And that's the thing. We don't just do this with each other. We do it in our relationship with God. I mean, what if there are things that God has been saying to you that your soul desperately needs to hear, but you can't hear them because your entire conversation with him is being filtered through a broken picture of who he actually is. What if there's something that he's wanting to do for the people in your life, your kids, your husband, your wife, your friends, your neighbors, and he's wanting to use you to do that, but you're holding back and holding out because your default with God isn't that he's full of mercy and compassion and love and faithfulness. Now, the good news for all of us is that we can change all of that. We can shift the conversation. You can actually let God reframe for you who he actually is and how he feels about you and how he's acted towards you. So my question for you this morning is, what is it that you most believe about God? Really, truly. And then do you actually live like that's true? Maybe it's time that you and I actually intentionally establish a different foundation, a different context for our conversations and our interactions with God than the one that we just default to. And the way that you do that is by listening. See, the truth is the conversation between us and God, it really starts with us listening. Some of us, all we do is talk, but it's his words, it's his voice that brings life. And what is it that he wants to say to you? Well, he wants you to know who he is. And he wants you to know his heart and his posture towards you. And by the way, that's who Jesus is. He's the full expression of God's compassion and mercy and grace and forgiveness and faithfulness and freedom and unfailing love. He 
is God's lavish love. Colossians chapter 3, it actually says that, that Jesus is the full expression of who God is. And so I'm going to invite you to do something with me this week. I, I, I took a moment and kind of paraphrased God's words from Exodus 34 so that they're a little bit easier for me to remember. And I'm going to put them on my phone as my home screen. But I just want to invite you, write them down, take a picture of this screen, write them down somewhere, think about them, memorize them. How, how does God, just so you could remind yourself who it is that you're talking to. So here it is. God is over and above everything. Nothing is impossible for him. He is full of compassion and mercy. He's endlessly patient, forever faithful, and can always be trusted. He forgives even my worst faults, failures, and sin. His love never fails. What if you started every day reminding yourself of that is, that is the, the God that you're in relationship with. That is the God you're talking to. That is the God that you have an ongoing conversation with. If you do that, I think it would change everything. In a moment, I really want to pray for you, but I did not want us to have, to talk to you about having a conversation with God and us not make room for you to have a conversation with God this morning. So Charlie's just going to sing for a couple of minutes. And what I'm going to invite you to do in the next couple of minutes, you can listen to what he's, the words that he's singing, but you can know this, that God is speaking to you. And if you'll quiet the noise in your heart and mind, you'll be actually begin to be able to hear what he's saying. You begin to listen to who he is for you and what he's done for you. So I want to invite you for a couple of minutes just to think, reflect, pray, have a conversation with God. Lord, I, um, <clears throat> I'm so grateful. When you came to us, you began to explain and introduce yourself. God, you could have described yourself in so many different ways. But you came and talked to us about mercy and compassion, grace and love, forgiveness and faithfulness not just for us, but our kids and grandkids, for a thousand, a thousand generations. Lord, the reality is for some of us, God, we have some situations in our life that are pretty wrecked. Some of it's our own doing. A lot of it might not be. Lord, and we're just trying to find where you might be in the middle of that. The truth is, God, you have stepped into our brokenness and our shame. You've step, stepped into our mess and our sin. Jesus, you came and gave yourself for us. That the compassion and mercy and grace, the unfailing love and freedom and forgiveness of God, that you, you were the embodiment of all of that. And you came and lavished that on humanity. Lord, I, I know that I still have some broken ideas about what you're like. Lord, I pray, God, you would help me as I lean into these words that you have spoken, that you, the way in which you've described yourself, God, that, yeah, there's this reminder that our choices matter. God, that you don't bail us out of every situation. 
Our decisions have momentum. But God, in your faithfulness and in your love, you bring compassion and grace, even in the midst of all of that stuff. And so, Lord, we want to listen and hear your voice. God, would you help us this week? Every single person in this week, this week God, in this room, is going gonna, is gonna to pray at some point, whether it's whispering a prayer of de- desperation, God, whether it's just a prayer of frustration, a prayer of reaching out to you, or God, whether they have time that they set aside on a regular basis to try to spend time with you and have a conversation with you. And I pray, God, in all of these different moments, in all of these different experiences, God, that you would show up in such a beautiful way, exactly who you are, exactly how you've described yourself. God, religion has been so good at distorting what's true about you in an effort to try to control us through shame and guilt. But you have come to set us free. Lord, we want, God, we want to be able to have a conversation with you based on who you are, not on our broken perceptions or ideas. We want to be able to hear your voice do what you say. We want to be able to live for you and talk to you and share our life with you because you love us. You really, really love us. Thank you, God, for your love and grace this morning. In your name we pray. Amen and amen.